Elon Musk is the most influential figure in artificial intelligence. And when you combine that with his media reach and his personal wealth, like it or not, we have to realize that the future of the world rests more on his decisions than anyone else's. And because of this fact, it's worth scrutinizing what the biographer Walter Isaacson learned about Elon Musk's psychology and how his opinions and decisions behind closed doors have actually been in regards to AI the more we can predict how our technological future will be ushered in. In Walter Isaacson's new biography on Elon Musk, he characterizes Elon as somebody who's, quote, driven by demons. But as Walter explores Elon's upbringing and business history, his anti-establishment views and his constant internal feeling of being an outsider, these demons start to come into focus. And look, as far as his media power goes, owning an entire social network as a private citizen allows him to spread any message that he wants to so many people around the world. He's clearly the most influential single person that the world and America has ever had. And yet he reveals to Walter Isaacson how he does believe that he can turn Twitter into the world's largest financial system and become unfathomably more rich than he is now. What he needs is not any more net worth, but he needs more brain cycles to apply to the alignment problem. What's the point of all that wealth and trying to get to Mars if you have an AI that upends society as we know it and we lose control as the dominant species on this planet? Around five years ago, I remember somebody asking Elon Musk about why he's concerned about artificial intelligence taking over the world, and he referenced this story. Humans create an artificial intelligent, it lives a completely tortured existence, it hates existing, it hates being on all the silicon chips that we've made for it, and in retaliation, it hates us and wants us to live this really tortured existence. The story definitely gave me the willies for weeks, but ever since then, I've never been able to think about Elon Musk's opinion on AI without realizing that that story is in his head too. The weird backwards way is makes me reassured because the people who think that it's just another piece of technology, it's not a big deal. They protected me. Took better care of me than humans would have. They're not people, Maya. It's just programming. Those are the ones that are gonna get this thing wrong. So maybe this is what we need. The world needs a benevolent dictator, somebody who's a single person in control of the entire media landscape, someone who Rupert Murdoch, Ted Turner, and Michael Bloomberg together couldn't even hold a candle to. You have to understand, Elon Musk could call up the president of any country and they would take a phone call with him. He can single-handedly harness his entire social network. He also has an unlimited budget to get the advertising out in any other way Way that his money can buy. And he's on the verge of having his own artificial intelligence systems to go out there and spread the message for him in other places. So let's explore the possibility of him not using this for nefarious, profit-seeking only motives, but to actually help us align artificial intelligence. So we'll start with Walter Isaacson's insight in the biography into how in this moment, this is a brand new biography, Elon Musk sees how close we are to AGI and what the landscape looks like. And Walter Isaacson picked up on this concept that he thinks of it in two stages. There is what he's behind on, what OpenAI has, a large language model that is incredibly intelligent. But it's not really AGI, artificial general intelligence, until it gets embodied out into the real world. And in that half of the equation, he believes that Tesla is the leading artificial intelligence company. They have all of the information coming in from the cars, they're working on the humanoid robots. They understand the real three-dimensional world. They can put that kind of technology into drones and for now use it to navigate. And in the near future, they can get the other half of the equation by building their own large language model or possibly even taking what Meta's done dumping onto the internet open source. Maybe they build on top of that and then slowly roll out their own solution. And together with the hardware and the software side, they have the brains and the body of AGI. Isaacson describes him as quote, zany, loudmouthed, unpredictable, and wild. Which is weird because there's so many podcasts where he seems quiet and thoughtful, but clearly his actions are kind of punchy and, and over the top sometimes. So I'm having trouble reconciling all of that, but if Walter Isaacson was in the room during these meetings, I think we should trust him. Isaacson also says that he's known for his intense engineering focus and a penchant for drama even during smooth times. 
He reportedly even experiences these manic mood swings, at times deep depression and at other times risk seeking highs. And in some ways I feel like I can relate to that mentality because even though I wouldn't characterize myself as that way, at times in the past when I felt very overwhelmed by projects and I was having a constant anxiety feeling every day, the way I was responding seems a little bit like that, just not at that scale. But also I didn't have that kind of pressure on me either. I remember thinking there's all these things I need to do. I got to dismiss with the niceties, the punch, punch, punch my points home and get right to it. And then at the same note, I would try to dive into a problem and I would crave that flow state. So you would push everything in the world away and like get deep into a problem because that was actually fairly calming. So when he's described as being in these kind of zones or sort of manic and kind of pushing things around, it feels to me like that could be an exaggerated version of what I felt. So then I asked the next question, is that kind of an intense builder mentality, like straight to the point, then engineer straight to the point, this build, build, build mentality, what is needed to steer humanity towards a safe alignment with AI? And I think the answer is probably not, but maybe. Like an extreme builder who gets into flow state might not take the time to contemplate how all the pieces are gonna fit together. And the pieces have to be a coalition with other people. It's not competitive in the same way it was Tesla versus the car companies. He would have to call up Mark Zuckerberg and say, I don't know if I believe in open source. We need to get all this under one umbrella so that we can control it. He'd also have to do the same with Larry Page and the current president and the Chinese president. And you'd have to work really hard to get all of these people working on the same platform basically. I mean, it's possible, but you really have to show a lot of respect to people, understand where they're coming from, and then negotiate something that makes sense for everyone. So if he views XAI as truly a competitor to OpenAI, and they want to just basically be private in the same way, but use that technology just for Tesla and Elon's goals, I don't see that being what we need. There is an argument that maybe these things should be open source, but I'm more on the counter argument for that. And I got my thoughts mostly from Eliezer Yudkowsky, who was around Elon during the early days when he was forming a lot of these opinions, some of those early conferences where this was discussed. And I think at that point, it kind of made sense to think of Google as a big company and that you need sort of counterbalances of AI out there in the world to just be more safe. But as you think about it more, this isn't really like nuclear weapons where you can just have mutually assured destruction to keep everything in balance. They're just simply too powerful of tools. And I think the people with the most powerful tools should do their best to keep it behind a fence and fix the problem before it goes out into the open. However, open source has been successful in many ways in the past. It just doesn't feel like the right correlation to me, but it could be, and maybe some people see things I don't. I'm just throwing out my opinion on that one. But I will say from the inside information that Walter Isaacson gives us, the way that he handled Twitter isn't the way we're gonna solve alignment. He went into Twitter headquarters with just extreme follow my rules. And it created a war with his staff, media, users, and liberal politicians. And maybe that's all part of generate all this content and get more attention and attention's all that matters or whatever. But with alignment affecting all of us, the big winner is not gonna be the big winner. It's not an election. It's not an advertising campaign. It's actually a superhuman intelligence on the same planet as us. So I think we need something like a Gandhi type. Maybe Elon Musk can move towards that and say, hey, I'm starting to get my head around just how big of a problem this is and I'm just gonna now sound the alarm. I'm gonna settle down. I'm gonna bring a coalition of people that can filter down and do the stuff that I should have been doing to bring us all under one umbrella. But before we hope for that, Walter actually gave us some insight into his long-term vision for AI. So here's what he said. Musk believes that AI systems need to be designed as an extension of human will. He wants to focus on developing AI that serves and enhances human interactions rather than replacing it. Musk does believe in the open source approach, evident by the whole idea of open AI being an open source kind of creator. He values multiple AIs as a check and balance system. Uh, Walter even touched on his humor style, which maybe isn't relevant, but it was interesting. Based Basically, Musk's humor style is the kind that would, quote, crack up a room full of stoned freshmen, suggesting a somewhat juvenile sense of humor. I mean, nothing wrong with that, I guess. It's just interesting. And it kind of makes me wonder, he had a bad relationship with his father. Is he, is there still part of him that's like not a true grown-up? Which actually might be part of his charm. The whole wide-eyed, the world can be anything. Like I'm just straight, you know, 21 year old, fresh out of college. And like, we can build anything we want. He has always had that mentality, looking at the future as if he's young, which is amazing. But you know, there's still some agitation towards some of the people he's worked with in the past, which I think would be important for him to get over. Isaacson talks a lot about the relationship with Sam Altman, who's now the CEO of OpenAI, and Demis Hassabis, who's usually been considered the leader in artificial intelligence. He runs DeepMind, which is owned by Google now. And you know, most of these conversations stem to around the 2012 
12 times. Isaacson talks in the book about a conversation between Musk and Demis, where Demis Hesipus is kind of the first one to go to Elon Musk and say, hey, like, have you thought about artificial intelligence and where it might be in 10 or 15 years and how that could be really dangerous for the world? Like a long pause and he thought about it and he finally said, no, I, I haven't, but I've now digested that. And would you like some money for DeepMind? Uh, leading him to offer an investment of $5 million at the time. Talks about some long debates that he had with Larry Page, you know, the CEO of Google at the time. And at least from the way I was reading it, it seemed like it was Elon's concerns that made it so that Larry Page actually, when acquiring DeepMind, put some boundaries between them. There was a formation of a safety council, which actually Elon sat on. But after a few meetings, he determined that it was ineffective and just left. There's another point where he actually asked asked Sam Altman to come meet with him where it seemed like he just berated him for like, turning the company private. Even though I think he uses that strategically because the company is private, but at a certain, it's a capped for profit. It will turn into a nonprofit again. And of course, I'm of the opinion that it's good that they've kind of closed off some of their technology actually. There's also a lot of details trying to take over OpenAI and then having the technology that they're developing being used at Tesla and wanting a wall between that. And that's part of their separation. And how Musk actually initially bought Twitter for different reasons than collecting the data for AI, but but then sort of realized as OpenAI was scraping that data and it was one of the many sources they were using how he should be locking that down and using it for his own projects. At times he did say things to Isaacson about XAI that we've never heard before. Like the goal for XAI is to include developing an AI capable of writing computer code, a chatbot competitor to ChatGPT, and to make sure that it's trying to maximize its truth seeking and reasoning. So it should be able to truly think on its own, understand the universe on its own, and give us insights that some of these other large language models are not capable of today. Walter Isaacson in his biography also really dives into how Elon Musk is truly anti-establishment deep down in his core. Isaacson even describes it as, quote, a conspiratorial mindset about the establishment. And he touches on how that might impact the upcoming election, but you know, I'm more concerned with long-term alignment safety with these kind of problems. So at the end of the day, I don't like this anti-establishment view anymore. I understand how that's part of how we grew up and probably growing up poor and having a hard life and you know, not understanding your father in the way that a lot of us would. I could see how that drove him to being such a great entrepreneur. But at this point, being essentially the world's richest person and still having this kind of contempt for the elites might still be a mindset where you can't encompass the entire world. Stepping back from that whole dichotomy of who the elites are and who they're not, going all the way down to the core of what it is for humans to be happy and focusing all the way down there so you can grab the whole world and unify them. I think it needs to be his next growth phase, his next goal. And it's totally possible. We all improve ourselves all the time. And especially when you're in that kind of a position and take it to the next level, you know? Harness that inner Gandhi and try to think about what's best for us and not fight everything. If you've read Walter Isaacson's new biography on Elon Musk or you have some thoughts about the way I interpret it or my opinions, leave them in the comments below. And while you're there, smash that subscribe button and help me get to 7,000 subscribers. My next goal, I'm out.